Hi everybody, we're going to get right into the next part of chapter 3, talking about cell diversity. So we have a lot of different types of cells. Um, the human body contains over 200 types of cells. Um, these cells vary in shape size and in function. So remember in chapter one, we talked about structure determining function. The structure of the cell determines its function. So some cells are super small, um, while others can be very, very large to the way they could be macroscopic. Um, and depending on the cell structure and size will determine how it functions. So some cells, we have fibroblasts that function in producing cable-like proteins, really, really strong proteins. Um, these proteins help to hold structures together. They are binding proteins. They also help to resist mechanical stressors. We have erythrocytes. These are cells that carry, um, they're also known as red blood cells, that carry oxygen, nutrients, throughout our body, and they also carry waste products away from our cells. So here you can see what a fibroblast looks like, and these are the fibers that are produced by the fibroblasts. Here are the erythrocytes. Um, very interesting. Fibroblasts contain the nucleus. They contain organelles. They can replicate. Erythrocytes do not. Erythrocytes contain no organelles. They expel their nucleus right before they maturate so that they can carry as much hemoglobin as possible, uh, which is why red blood cells can't fix themselves, and so they have a very short lifespan compared to many other cells. We have cells that line our body. They're either covering or lining cells. That's what they're typically called. These are called epithelial cells. These are very tightly packed cells and they contain multiple desmosomes. They have hemidesmosomes holding them to the underlying connective tissue. They contain gap junctions for communication. And um, they are typically, when you think of them, they're like sheets of cells with very minimal extracellular material. So here's what your epithelial cells look like. Just packed cells, very tightly connected. Um, we have skeletal and smooth muscle, um, as well as cardiac muscle. Um, muscle tissue functions in contraction and relaxation and helps in movement of materials. So skeletal muscle moves the body. Smooth muscle moves materials within the body. Then we have cardiac muscle, which moves blood throughout the body. Um, we have cells that store nutrients. So an example would be a fat cell. Fat is um, fat cells or adipose sites store fat droplets. Um, and these cells can contain a lot of fat. They can just get larger and larger, uh, which is why when fat gets deposited on the body, it can just grow and grow and grow which is kind of a sad thing, but it's, you know, life. So here you see that lipid droplet. There's the nucleus. This lipid droplet can get larger and larger and larger. So you can just keep depositing more and more fat. If we have too much um, nutrients in our body and we don't need that much, we'll just store it for later use. We have cells that fight disease. So we have multiple white blood cells um, that have specific functions. Um, one example is your macrophage. A macrophage is a nonspecific white blood cell that um, is a phagocytic cell. A phagocytic cell is a cell that eats or breaks down um, potential pathogenic material, so dangerous material like 
bacteria. Uh, macrophages do have a nucleus. They have organelles. Um, they, their plasma membrane forms these pseudopods that can come or that can um, move around bacteria and other materials, forming a vesicle that they pull in and then break down the materials. We have nerve cells. Nerve cells take in and receive information, determine how to process that information, and then send the, the response out through the body. So here you have um, these dendrites. Dendrites are what take in the information. Then you have the cell body where you're going to have processing of information. And then this is the axon that leads to axon terminals that sends out a response to neighboring cells. We have um, cell sex cells. Oocytes are female sex cells. They're very large. They have the all the organelles. They have um, a lot of cytoplasm. And then we have they are non-motile as well. Then we have male sex cells called sperm. These contain only in the head, the nucleus that contains half of the DNA. Um, the rest of the sperm functions only in movement towards the egg and um, helps in dissolving the outer membrane of the egg so that the DNA can get into the egg so you can form a new organism. And there again is that sperm cell that we talked about earlier. Um, at this point, you should be able to tell me some major functions of different types of cells. We're going to get into um, some cell physiology. So we've talked about kind of the structure of cells, what they're composed of, and now we're going to talk about how they work. So most cells are able to do certain activities like metabolism. That's a typical type of activity that all cells can do. Whereas some cells are also able to reproduce, producing new cells. Um, some cells are able to respond to stimuli. Some cells can move while others can't. Sperm and egg, there you go. So before we talk about that, let's talk about um, how materials uh, enter into chemical reactions and move around. So uh, if you or to, to understand um, chemical reactions, you have to understand what a solvent and a solute is. A solution is a mixture of a solvent and solute. Solvents are dissolving mediums. A uh, typical solvent in our body is water. It dissolves all polar molecules, um, whereas any type of oil would be a good solvent for fat-soluble materials. Solute, then, is a component um, that is dissolved in the solution or in the solvent. There are two major um, fluid environments. We have intracellular fluid and then we have extracellular fluid. Inside of the nucleus, we have nucleoplasm. Inside of the um, plasma membrane, we have cytoplasm. Outside, we have extracellular fluid, also known as interstitial fluid. And so inside and outside, the materials may differ slightly. So in both cases, you're going to have lots of water, though. So plasma membrane is a selectively permeable barrier. This barrier is going to keep materials from entering the cell or exiting the cell unless we want them to enter or exit. So it's kind of like the plasma membrane, I think of it as like a bouncer at a bar. And it'll determine who's going to come in, who's going to come out, who it's going to hold off, who may come in through certain um, doorways. <laughs> 
So there are different types of processes to allow materials into or out of the cell. The first um, are called passive processes, and the second are active processes. I am not going to play this video right now. Um, this is an excellent video that you can watch. I have it linked right here. All you have to do is click on this blue and then watch the video. And once you've watched the video, um, or come back to this, my lecture, and watch the next material, okay? Or, and listen to the next material. So, passive processes, the first one we talk about is diffusion. Diffusion is movement of materials from higher to lower concentration down a gradient. So, here you have a cube of dye and it's in a beaker of water. There's a high concentration of the solute here, very low concentration out here. So as time moves, this, this dye is going to dissolve, this dye, um, this dye cube is going to dissolve, and the dye is going to disperse from higher to lower concentration until you're at equilibrium. So things that affect diffusion, the size of the molecule, larger molecules move slower, um, smaller molecules move faster. Temperature, so if you have a higher temperature, things dissolve faster. Things that move via simple diffusion are going to be small and nonpolar typically. So any type of molecules that are lipid soluble are going to be able to move directly through the plasma membrane via diffusion. There's simple diffusion where you have small nonpolar molecules passing directly through the plasma membrane. And then we have osmosis. Osmosis is where water moves from higher to lower concentration through that plasma membrane. That's a type of diffusion. Um, water can move directly through the plasma membrane, but it typically uses aquaporins. Aquaporins are the little protein channels that allow water to move very easily across. Um, when you talk about osmosis, there are different types of solutions um, that determine which way water is going to move. An isotonic solution has the same amount of solute and water concentration as a cell. So if you're in an isotonic environment, your cells and your extracellular environment are have equal amounts of water and solute ratio. Hypertonic solutions contain more solutes than the cells do. And so what that means is the cells are going to release water and the cell itself is going to shrivel up. A hypotonic solution contains less solute than the cell does. And what that means is there's more water in the environment. So water moves into the cell where there's less water and more solute and the cell's going to get very, very large. I always think of hypertonic, hyper children. And they're typically, when you think of hyper children, you're looking at little kids like two, three, four, five, six, um, very hyper, very active, and they're small. So the cell shrivels up, gets smaller. And hypotonic hippos are large, hippo, hypo, cell um, gets very large and it can burst. And then we have facilitative diffusion. Facilitative diffusion is um, movement of molecules down that concentration gradient from higher to lower concentration. But in this case, we're looking at lipid insoluble, so water soluble molecules, um, like ions moving across the membrane, or maybe um, glucose moving across the membrane. In this case, this is a glucose, this is a protein channel. Da, 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 da. It doesn't tell me what it does. So I'm just going to call this glucose, but it could be for, you know, a lot of different things. Um, then we have filtration. And so I found this 
image. Um, I was just, I looked up on Google images, trying to find something that would show filtration because there was not good, a good picture. Um, so filtration is, occurs when water and solutes are forced through a membrane. So when you think of filtration, think of like a bulk flow, lots of materials moving rapidly and as water moves solutes move with it so um like coffee right so here we have a mixture of water and sand we put a filter and then we um filter the material anything that's small enough to fit through the filter is going to go through and in this case sand is not small enough so it's going to stay up here but what filtration does is it allows materials to move from that higher to lower concentration with the use of water as a pressure gradient um, the next material or the next process that we talk about is active transport so active transport processes use ATP, typically I'll say, I use ATP to move materials across the membrane, a lot of times against their plasma or against their concentration gradient. So they're moving from lower concentration to a higher concentration, or they are super large. And so it takes energy to move them into or out of the cell. The first active process we'll talk about are um, pumps. And then we'll talk about vesicular transport. So a pump is a molecule that binds ATP to activate. And then the pump pushes materials against their concentration gradient from one side of the membrane to another side. The most common pump that we have is a sodium potassium pump. And the sodium potassium pump, we're pushing sodium against its concentration gradient out of the cell. So sodium is in a higher concentration outside of the cell, typically. And then we are pushing potassium from lower concentration to higher concentration into the cell. So we have a high concentration of potassium inside of our cells, sodium outside. The pump works, ATP binds, so let, let me just first, okay, the first step Sodium is going to bind to the inactive pump. It's at a rest position, open to the internal environment. Then ATP binds. When ATP binds, it gets activated. And um, so ATP is broken down to ADP plus the phosphate. The activated pump then opens to the extracellular environment. Sodium is released outside it can no longer bind it's not able to bind those binding spots have changed configuration but now it has an opening for potassium so potassium comes in and binds when the phosphate moves away the pump goes back to its resting configuration um, where it's open to the internal environment the potassium no longer can bind but the sodium now can move back in and so this is going to continue, and this is actually how we maintain a high sodium gradient outside of the cell and a high phos um, potassium, not phosphate, sorry, potassium gradient inside of the cell, which is necessary for muscle contractions, nervous impulses, so it's super important. And then we have vesicular transport, where we're moving materials that are very large across the plasma membrane. So there are two types of vesicular transport we look at, um, exocytosis and endocytosis. Um, under the header of endocytosis, we have three types of endocytosis. I only have two listed here, but I will talk about the other one as well. Um, that's phagocytosis, pinocytosis, and receptor-mediated endocytosis. So exocytosis, um, it's sounds just like what's happening a vesicle is formed inside of the cell and that vesicle um, fuses with the plasma membrane and something inside the vesicle whatever material is inside the vesicle is then going to be released to the extracellular environment so materials exit the cell exocytosis exiting the cell and so this is the figure that was referred to right here, figure 
Um, and here you can see exocytosis. We have materials inside of the cell. The vesicle binds with the plasma membrane and the material exits the cell. Um, and this is just showing a little bit closer how exocytosis works. The, the membrane that binds to the plasma membrane actually becomes part of that plasma membrane and materials can be released in that fashion. This is just showing an uh, electron micrograph of exocytosis occurring. It's kind of cool looking. Then we have endocytosis. So in endocytosis, materials in the extracellular environment come into the cell using vesicle vesicular transport. The first type of endocytosis, so this is showing pinocytosis. This is just a, a figure showing pinocytosis. I'll talk about it here, but I'll give you the definition again in a little bit, okay? So almost all of our cells can undergo pinocytosis where a tiny little vesicle forms and then it takes in water droplets um, or fluid and within the fluid there is some dissolved solutes that move into the cell. So these materials then inside the cell can be broken down or can be utilized by the cell in whatever me mechanism they need to be utilized. And sometimes once they're broken down, we might release other materials. So the first type of endocytosis we're going to talk about um, here is called phagocytosis. So this is cellular eating. So we take a large particle such as bacteria, a body cell, something like that, is engulfed by pseudopods, um, which form from the cytoplasmic, or from the plasma membrane, I'm sorry, cytoplasmic extensions, from the, from the plasma membrane. And the pseudopods form a vesicle, and then that vesicle blubs off into the cell. So Phagocytosis can only be can only occur on certain or in certain types of cells like uh, macrophages, neutrophils, B lymphocytes. They are able to undergo phagocytosis. The material that's in the phagocytic vesicle is oftentimes going to bind with a lysosome, forming a phagolysosome and then be broken down further into small pieces that can be released via exocytosis. Pinocytosis then is cellular drinking. This is what all, all of our cells, almost all of our cells can do, where we take in tiny droplets of fluid containing dissolved materials. Um, and so these, once they take in the materials, they can then utilize the materials and um, or release them, um, you know, break the materials down further and release them if they need to. And again, this is that pinocytic vesicle that I was talking about before. Um, so here you might bring that material in and then depending on what you're going to do with the material, you may break it down further or you may utilize the material inside the plasma membrane or inside the cell, not inside the plasma membrane. Well, it would be in the plasma membrane, but in the cell, okay? The last type of endocytosis is receptor-mediated endocytosis. So this is a specialized endocytosis in which certain molecules bind to proteins on the plasma membrane. And once these proteins have been bound, then a phagocytic vesicle forms surrounding those um, bound proteins and that phagocytic vesicle then pulls the materials into the cell. Um, it is a selective process which is why it's called receptor mediated because you have to have materials bound to the specialized receptors on the cell. This is how we move cholesterol from our blood into our cells so that we don't have high cholesterol levels in our body. All right, at this point, you should be able to tell me some different passive and uh, mechanisms to move materials into and out of the cells.
Um, tell me what hypotonic, hypertonic, and isotonic solution is. Um, what are different active transport mechanisms that move materials into and out of the cell? I'm going to stop here. This has been a 25-minute video, which is really long. I don't like to do too long of videos. Um, I will post this, and then I will get into video three. So have a great day.